This is Jocko Podcast number 97 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. To the master stonemason in the town of Mansfield. Greetings in God, much beloved parents. If my small letter finds you in good health, I should be mightily glad. What concerns me, I am pretty much in health. Here in the white country, we'll have to die all of hunger. All is burnt, and the Russian army has carried off all subjects, as they had such a fear of us, and there is no food to be found because nobody is to be found in any town. Whenever a house is found, it is empty and dark. Dear parents, I have to give news of our last battle, as we had already gone hungry for three days and marched day and night at five in the morning, we marched into this battle with a cabbage stump in our stomach. And we were in, in it until the evening. And then we again had nothing and could not eat for tiredness. Only cannon fire from morning to evening. God has helped me out of the third battle also without harm, though the bullets hailed down pretty well, as if one were to take peas and throw them at someone. But none got me. The whole cavalry is lost. Now I want to write you about the Russian town of misery, Moscow which is seven hours walk long and as wide, and the Russians put fire to it. For four hours it burned, and then it was extinguished. And we were stationed before Moscow, and I don't know whether we are going forward or back. I don't know what to write, except that you will shortly see many cripples without arm and leg, and so many must die pitifully of hunger and terrible dangers. Russians appear all the time for the last battle. Let's end now. Finally, farewell and stay healthy until we speak again. Many greetings to brothers and sisters, brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, to the Baltzans, the Krogans, and all good friends and acquaintances. And I am quite well, if only I can live. Farewell. I remain your faithful son until death. Johann Andreas Warnick. So, Napoleon, who is often praised by many, including myself, praised as a military genius, and he was one of the first military leaders to effectively utilize psychological warfare. And this included, most famously, his Bulletins de la Grande Army which was sort of an update, it was like a newspaper that was sent out while the campaigns of France were being embarked upon. And that was his media, so he had control of it. And he also controlled mail that his troops sent home and made sure that it painted a positive picture of what was happening downrange. And that is where that opening letter came from. And it was actually excerpts of a letter, but it was confiscated by the military of the Kingdom of Westphalia, which was a vassal state under the first French empire, which was Napoleon's empire. And the Kingdom of Westphalia, which is a, a German piece of land, and it provided hundreds of thousands of soldiers for the Napoleonic Wars. And when I say provided soldiers, I should say specifically conscripts, which are basically slave soldiers. You have no choice, you will go and fight. And over time, 
Westphalia was eventually conquered by the Russians for a period and then some of the confiscated letters survived and ended up as historical documents that explained what was happening on the ground and that's where that letter came from through old Russian files where they had they had this letter and again we make a habit of glorifying Napoleon and I have done it right here on this podcast which is actually pretty substandard behavior for me since I always try to listen to the voice and hear the voice and understand the viewpoint of the foot soldier the grunt the frontline troops on the battlefield because that is where the fighting takes place those are the men that execute the plans of the general and that is where the wars are actually won and history as a whole has a tendency to forget about them because generally it's the admirals and the generals that write the memoirs but in this case we are going to hear from one of Napoleon's grunts a guy by the name of Jacob Walter and he is a German conscript who was fighting for France so this is a guy who grew up in Germany but when Germany was became part of and became a vassal state like a subordinate state of the Empire of France then he ended up fighting for France but even more and you're gonna find this out quickly he was fighting for his own survival so let's go to this book the book is called the diary of a Napoleonic foot soldier by Jacob Walter and here we go in the year 1806 I was drafted with many of my comrades into military service in the conscription at that time and was assigned to the regiment of Romig in the fall I traveled with the regiment to Prussia in the campaign which Emperor Napoleon with the princes then his allies was conducting at that time against Prussia and this is interesting because I've talked about on this podcast before the Battle of Jena and what happened at the Battle of Jena and what happened at the Battle of Jena is that the Prussian army was defeated pretty savagely by Napoleon's army and that made them make some major adjustments to the way they ran things and that was kind of the beginning of decentralized command from the German perspective but this guy Walter Jacob Walter was actually there mm. now this is what's interesting and I, I, I go take some time to paint this picture of the way these soldiers operated back then first of all they marched just about everywhere and sometimes they'd ride horses but sometimes they but most of the times they marched and when they marched what they would do is just wherever they were whatever village they were in they would go in and get quarters in that village they'd go in hey we're here we're, we need to stay in your house mm. and we need to get fed and that's what they did and people allowed them to do it I mean a bunch of people with guns show up at your house and say we want food and beds you, you know these people gave them what they wanted mm. sometimes willingly depending when they were traveling out of their own country mm. so when they were in Germany there or, or in their Westphalia the the locals as they were leaving the locals would give them hey we'll support you it's a military guy we will support you and then when they got into enemy territory they would be have to be more forceful but here's how it starts off with him marching we were given good quarters everywhere, which kept me always healthy and cheerful in spite of the continuous marching. Furthermore, I was only 19 years old, a fact which caused me frequently to participate in thoughtless and dangerous enterprises. I think he was getting after it as a young 19 year old. And this is another thing that's interesting. So this guy, these conscripts, they weren't, they weren't permanent soldiers. They were more like reservists where they would go and fight and when the war was over, they'd go back home and continue with whatever their job was. Mm. And so that's what happens to him. He you know, gets tasked, he's only 19 years old, boom, you're gonna go fight. He says, okay, starts going and marching. Back to the book. In this city, it happened in my quarter that a comrade wanted to force the landlord to sing. 
However, he refused to do so, sitting the whole night on a bench near the stove, weeping. Since this man could not sing because of his sorrow, sorrow, soldier Hummel wanted to frighten him, took his rifle, cocked the hammer, and shot. The bullet passed by me and another soldier and lodged in the wall. I wanted to mention this in order to show how the soldiers were running wild at that time. So, like I said, when they were in their own country, they'd get good support and everyone would take care of them, but then the further they got into other countries, they had to use force. Mm. A spy who was in the village, a, a spy who was a village smith was brought before the guardhouse. He had letters and orders to tell Prussians of our strength in manpower. He was laid on a bench and whipped by two or three corporals. Two men had to hold his feet and to his head. His leather breeches were stretched out and water poured on them. And then he received about 150 blows. At last, he could no longer speak because he was half dead. After this experience, the smith was taken to the threshing floor and shot. Blows with clubs also were heaped upon many innocent people in this city. So these guys are... Things turn bad real quick. Things turn bad real quick. And, and I can't even imagine in these days where there's a lot less accountability. And you have 19-year-old soldiers coming into towns and just basically doing whatever they want. Back to the book. Finally, when light fire... Now they're getting into a, an attack situation. Finally, when light firing began upon the outpost, we were commanded to attack by wading through the rampart ditches with fascines, with fascines to tread these in and to scramble up the outworks by chopping and shoveling. When I stood in the ditch, each first soldier had to pull up the next one with his rifle. The ramparts were of sand and everyone frequently fell back again because of the attack of the enemy or just because of the sliding sand. Yet in that place, the huge cannonballs flew above us thundering so violently that we would have believed the earth would burst to pieces. When everyone was almost on top of the earthwork, the Prussians were slaughtered with great vigor, and the rest took flight into the gate. Then we too wanted to gain possession of the gateway in order to enter the city, but at this critical time many of these Prussians were shot along with our men by small and large guns, and the gate was closed. Since all sorts of shells and rockets broke out of the fortress like a cloud burst, we had to take flight. Those who meanwhile were scrambling up the outworks had to jump from the fortress into the moat along with their prisoners, and all the rest had to do likewise. During this retreat, many fell on bayonets, many drowned, and many of us were also brought into the fortress as prisoners and sent away to Danzig by sea. Now it's interesting, this guy, the way he writes, it's, it's very matter of fact mm -hmm. as to what happens. And again, this is a relatively, I'm gonna take you to, through three campaigns. This is the first one. The last one is the campaign into Russia, the famous, Napoleon's famous march into Russia to try and take Russia. At, and everyone knows how that story ends, it's not good. But this first one is, uh, like I said, against the Prussians. Back to the book. One morning, the Prussians surprised the Polish camp from the sea with their ships, as had happened before Easter. The cannon fire on the poles was so heavy that they could not withdraw fast enough. Their cannonballs also traveled more than half again as far toward our camp as our balls did across the water, since the surrounding swamps were frozen and the balls could roll along on ice so fast that one ball took off the feet and legs of 10 or 12 men frequently both feet of the same man. During this blockade, the Prussians frequently made attacks, although every time with great losses. What a nightmare that is. You're standing on frozen swamps and these cannonballs are being fired at, at a really low angle and just screaming across the ice and taking out 10 to 12 guys, legs, feet. <sighs> Going back to the book, when I arrived in this field, I hastened to look for my brother, who was in the Lillenberg Regiment. Here we met, embraced and greeted one another, and joy filled our hearts. 
Then he took me into his barracks and gave me trousers, shirts, and several other pieces of clothing which I needed since, as, I've, as I have already said, I lost almost everything at Kohlberg. So he's out there and his brother's also out there fighting. Mm-hmm. And they, they happen to run in, into each other from time to time. Back to the book. While the enemy had to defend themselves around and in the crowded part of the city, a terrible shelling of light and heavy artillery broke in upon us, and all of us had to abandon the positions we had taken. Large mines were exploded in the breastwork, and everywhere there flew rockets, so called pitch rings, which could be put out only with small boxes as they fell on the ground. If any one would or could be an onlooker at frightful explosions, he could get the finest view at a fortress attack, which is more remarkable, which is a more remarkable sight by far than a battlefield. The bombs and grenades crisscrossing in the air in such great numbers, all floating like balls of fire in the air and exploding or bursting in the air or on the ground with a small cannon report, the slow ascent of each shell, the fast descent, often also a collision of them in the air. All this is a sight of moving beauty. So you get the you get kind of a sense for how much firepower and again you don't really think of that very often of of how these how these battles would take place and how much firepower there is but there's obviously massive amounts of rocket fire <sighs> grenades cannons rifle horrible uh, and that's the first section that first campaign against Prussia is relatively short they achieved victory in that campaign and he goes back like I said he goes back like a reservist to his normal life and when he goes back to his normal life survives that way for a while or lives that way for a while and then he gets recalled again going back to the book while I was working in various ways to at my trade after the Prussian campaign the war with Austria broke out in 1809 and I was called into the garrison at Stuttgart and what this this one is a little bit more of an insurgency. They're, they're putting down the Tyrolean insurgents in this battle. Relatively short. But here's where they are holding up a, a fort, basically. Back to the book. We fired through the loopholes and from the wall with cannon and small guns. During the heavy shelling, I shot a man in front of the garden house as he came in a little way forward toward the breastwork and aimed into the loophole. But after I shot and he suddenly fell, several others wanted to carry off this dead man, and as was often done. However, the more openly it was done, the more often other men were hit too. Finally, we fired with cannon, throwing projectiles into large and beautiful garden houses, setting them all in flames. On the third day, the enemy could no longer hold out because of the heavy artillery fire and moved back into the mountains. So here's a classic lesson, a classic lesson of combat. If there's a wounded person, you can't run out and get him. You have to suppress fire, and that's exactly what he's saying here. He shot a guy. Somebody came out to try and pull him back. He shot that guy too. Somebody came out to pull them. You shoot that person too. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is suppress fire. When someone gets wounded as as hard as it is to do that that's what you have to do and when you say as hard as it is to do that that's because when you know oh your friend is wounded yes you, you kind of the automatic thing is to go get him real quick Th- that's exactly right that's yeah. exactly right it's an emotional attachment yeah and yeah, it's an yeah. emotional decision that people all the pe- most people are, are tempted to make yeah. hey echo shot I'm gonna go save him so I run over to save you and I get shot too mm-hmm. and again that campaign you know you could hear the the insurgents go back up in the mountains and he carries on a little bit with that but the focus that I wanted to get to today was this campaign in Russia so here we go back to the book in the month of January 1812 I was recalled to the garrison of Schorndorf. And they know that they're going to Russia. They know that that's where they're heading. Um, But they know it's gonna be tough. But here we go back to the book. Here's, Here's about their attitude. I and all the soldiers were very merry. 
always singing and dancing, especially since throughout the entire Würzburg country, the quarters and eating and drinking were very good, particularly because of the large supply of wine, so that everyone had his field flask voluntarily filled with wine in his pockets with cookies at the time of departure. Moreover, the beautiful villages on the main river surrounded by vineyards, fruit trees, and grain fields put everyone in a happy mood. About the middle of March, the army continued on its way through Saxe coburg where a wooded and mountainous region began. The pine trees were especially plentiful. So I, I was also thinking about this. You're, you're a working class guy in Germany in the early 1800s. You're working your job day to day. I don't know, I don't know what you're doing. What are you? You're, let's say you're a metal worker. Let's say you're a stone layer, a, a mason of some, whatever your job is. Mm. But you're working hard, you're getting your paycheck, probably not great, and then all of a sudden they say, hey, you wanna go on a little adventure? You're gonna get to take what you want, you get to go out, you're gonna get good food. It, it, you can, I can kinda sense that attitude. And it's the same thing that happens with military guys today, myself included, mm-hmm. where you know I'm growing up in a small town and everyone just kinda lives and dies in this small town, and all of a sudden there's an opportunity to go out and just Get after it, live mm. adventure, and see the world. You know that, that they used to say that in the in the navy. You know, yeah. join the navy and see the world. Yep. Hey, that sounds cool. Yeah, and that's kind of what this is here. Especially this guy's a veteran. He's been through some wars, been through some tough firefights, and and obviously seen some significant casualties. But at the same time, he's a veteran that he's he's come back. Mm. So he comes back to his, you know, like I said, I don't know what his civilian job was, but he was laying stones or pounding on an anvil, shaping metal or something like that, and all of a sudden, hey, you know what we want you to do? Go out and live in nice manners that you that you take down or that you, you uh, get quartered in, and they're gonna feed you great. Okay. And it continues, in, back to the book. In the city of Leipzig, anyone could see what was going to happen since many Frenchies, as could slip through, came crowding through the gates. Leipzig was packed with soldiers, and I was in quarters with 150 men. Yet the landlord to whom we were assigned put us all in one building, the former theater building, which was 100 feet tall, 100 feet long, and 60 feet wide. Triple rows of tables stood ready in the hall, very beautifully set and loaded with beer, brandy, butter, cheese, and white bread. After all had sat down, everybody ate and drank while eight servants brought in the warm meal which consisted of white soup, two kinds of meat, and several kinds of vegetables. In addition, something cold was served for dessert and drinks were served in abundance throughout the whole afternoon. We stayed here two days until the line of march formed by columns and the departure was ordered. So, like I said, living the pretty good life back to the book and then we went further and came to first involved a middle side city in Brandenburg di- Brandenburg district we were still very lively in this town singing and living cheerfully although we could imagine the unusual campaign before us but everyone always believes in and hopes for the best I also looked after my saber and made it very sharp at a turner's and tempered it in fire so that it would not break off. The march was continued to Poland through the village of Repin, where the use of German language stopped and the manners and cultures made a strange impression. It was the month of May and the air swarmed with May bugs so that amazingly, so amazingly that it was hard to keep your eyes open in the evening. The bugs were so very thick that they darkened the atmosphere and everyone was busy shaking them out of their face and hair. Here it became necessary for each person to seek and cook his own provisions, although requisitioning was forbidden. So you weren't allowed to go out and just take stuff, still. But you can see things are starting to get leaner However, everyone still had his full strength and courage was still alive in every soldier. But from day to day, privation and hunger increased and it became necessary for the regiment to requisition and slaughter livestock so that men could have some meat in addition to the potatoes and grits which they found here and there. Bread was rare and there was nothing at hand to buy. 
So again, you can see as they move, as they move to the east towards Russia from Germany through Poland, there's food is becoming less. And, and they had left in January, if you remember, and so now it's May, so the weather is actually, even though there's a lot of bugs, but the weather's, it's hot, which the Russian campaign, <laughs> there's, there's one of the best defenses that Russia has, if maybe the best defense that Russia has, and that's the Russian winter. But right now it's spring, it's springtime in Poland, so still not that bad yet. And back to the book, now the orders, now the orders led us from Thorn to Mariampol. The march went through Seaburg. The roads were sandy and dust covered, and dust covered our clothing. And you're gonna see how very quickly things turn for these soldiers. Back to the book, daily the hardships increased, and there was no hope of bread. My colonel spoke to us once and said that we could hope for no more bread until we crossed the enemy border. The most anyone might still get was a little lean beef, and hunger made it necessary to dig up, f- dig up the fields for the potatoes already sprouting, which were, however, very sweet and almost inedible. inedible. One also heard everywhere that several men had already shot themselves because of hardship. In particular, an officer had cut his own throat on that very same day. So, again, it's very interesting the way he writes. He's sort of matter of fact, but we have already have people that are starving, and they're starving, they're marching, and it's it's bad. It's bad enough that people are killing themselves. Mm. Yeah, it kind of seemed that, that, like that came out of nowhere right there. Yeah, and I, I, I skipped some pages, but I didn't skip that many pages. Yeah. I didn't skip that many pages. It it went pretty quick from from pretty decent living. It's it's two pages. It's th- sorry, it's three pages in the book. From pretty decent living, singing and living cheerfully to we got officers that are cutting their own throats. Yeah. Dang. And this whole campaign takes place in less than a year from January. They're back by December. Mm-hmm. So and they haven't, by the way, what's, what's interesting, they haven't met the enemy yet, right? Dang, that, that's, yeah. what's, that's what's one of the, you know, as I'm reading this and as you listen to it, you think they haven't even met the enemy yet. Yeah. They're just already, already people are dying, already people are killing themselves. Yeah, and I don't know how much this, he talks about this, but the, he says because of hardship, mm-hmm. like what? Just, just starving, marching, marching, marching and it's starving, just, being cold, being uncomfortable, privation, yeah, suffering. I've got too much. Yeah, and 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 your your light at the end of the tunnel is it's, combat yeah. with the Russians <laughs> okay. yeah, and, and a sense. Russian winner. Yeah. <sighs> Going back to the book, we believe that the Russians would wait. Oh, oh, sorry. Back to the book. Um, finally, we came to the Memel River, where the Russian border was. We believe that the Russians would wait on the other side of the bank and attack, but nothing happened. Bonaparte fired upon the high points held by Russians with a few cannon and sent his cavalry across the water. The Russians, however, withdrew after a for, after a short encounter. And this is this is is so cool to hear this because this is the Russian defensive tactic. Mm. You hold the you don't hold the line. You hold the line of a little bit, and then you and then you retreat, and you take you you know you you inflict some damage on the enemy. On the invaders, you inflict some damage on them, and then you retreat. Mm. And then they, they, when the enemy attack, when the in, invaders attack again, you inflict some damage, and then you retreat. And you're just drawing them in and drawing them deeper and deeper and deeper into Russia. And what they didn't expect, what they didn't expect, was that what the Russians did was very smart. When they retreated, before they retreated, they destroyed everything. They burned the houses. They, they t- killed the livestock if they couldn't take it with them. Mm. They dug the fields up so there was no food, because mm. that was the standard. The standard was, as an army, as a soldier in this time, you you lived off the land. There was no, you didn't need a supply chain. Yeah, you just yeah. lived off the land. Okay, we got we'll find some we'll, we'll hunt some meat and that's will be our dinner. Or we'll dig up some some crops that are that we find and that's what we'll eat Mm. oh and for shelter we don't need to carry shelter with us we'll just stay in the houses so the russians very smart they destroyed all that 
Mm. And the French were not expecting this tactic, yeah. and it was very, very effective. Back to the book, on June 25th, the army went over the bridges. We now believed that once in Russia, we need do nothing but forage, which, however, proved to be an illusion. The town of Ponimon was already stripped before we could enter, and so were all the villages. So they, they thought they might be living high on the hog, yeah, yeah. but didn't happen. Back to the book, here and there a hog ran around and then was beaten to death with clubs, chopped with sabers and stabbed with bayonets, and often, and often still living, it would be cut and torn to pieces. Several times I succeeded in cutting off something, but I had to chew it and eat it uncooked since my hunger could not wait for a chance to boil the meat. The worst torture was the march, because the closed ranks forced all to go in columns. The heat and dust flared up into our eyes as if from smoking coal heaps. The hardship was doubled by the continual halting of troops whenever we came to a swamp or a narrow road. Often one had to stand for half an hour, then another such period was spent catching up and drudging away without food or water. So this is, this is something that anybody that's done any kind of forced road march in the military can appreciate. You come to some kind of a choke point, like let's say you got people walking down a road and they're, let's say, 10 or 15 guys abreast and just marching and walking. And you get to something where it's a choke point. So now all of a sudden only three, it's like a traffic jam. Only three people can go across this walking bridge at a time. So that means everybody that gets there has to stop. Well, the people that got there first, when they get to the other side, they keep that pace going. So by the time you at the end of the tail an hour later or a half an hour later when you get across you've got to now run to catch back up Mm -hmm. and so it's just it's 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 painful Mm -hmm. and of course on top of that you add the fact that these guys have no water or food back to the book during the third night a halt was made in a field which was trampled into a swamp here we were ordered to camp and to make fires since the since neither village nor forest could be seen and the rain continued without end You can imagine in what a half-numbed condition everyone stood there. What could we do? There was nothing that we could do but stack rifles in pyramids and keep moving in order not to freeze. So it just went, in a day, it went from hot, and this happens out in the desert too. It's hot, and then all of a sudden at nighttime you're freezing. Yeah. And these guys, they get told to build fires. Well, guess what? There's no wood. Everything had been burned. All they could do is stack their rifles. Back to the book, we had to march further toward Disna, where we arrived in the middle of July. The men were growing weaker and weaker every day, and the companies smaller and smaller. The march was kept up day and night. One man after another stretched himself half dead upon the ground. Most of them died a few hours later. Several, however, suddenly fell to the ground dead. The chief cause of this was thirst, for in the most districts, there was no drinking water, there's no water fit for drinking, so that men had to drink out of ditches in which were lying dead horses and dead men. Another thing we take for granted these days, we got little pumps, little little filtration pumps. You can go up to a water with a dead horse in it, and you can filter that water out, or you can put an iodine tablet in it, and you're going to kill the bacteria, and it's safe to drink. These guys don't have that choice. They're either gonna drink this disease-ridden water or they're gonna die of dehydration. Now they get to another village, and here we go back to the book. In another well-plundered village, nothing could be found in the houses. And so, urged on by our hunger, we dug in the ground. Here I, with several others, removed a large pile of wood which had probably just been put there. We removed this, dug into the ground, and found a covered roof of planks. There was an opening under this from 10 to 12 feet deep. Inside, there were honey jars and wheat covered with straw. When we had all this, we opened the jars and saw a solid white substance with the appearance of hard wax. It was so hard that one had trouble breaking off a piece with his saber. But as soon as it was put on the fire, it all melted away to very clear honey. Now I had honey to eat for a week, although without bread. 
So they are occasionally finding food that is deeply hidden. There's a couple other instances where they find food that's been hidden by the locals, uh, but it's not enough to go around. And you can imagine how you're feeling when your entire diet is just jars of honey. Mm. Back to the book. On the morning of August 17th, every regiment was set in motion and all advanced in columns against the Russians. Here, every regiment without exception was under fire. Again and again, the troops attempted assaults, but because of the greater number of the Russians, we were forced back every time on this day since their heavy artillery stood on heights and could hit everything. Finally, by night, we had made good our position on the heights overlooking the city, and the battle was discontinued. So they attack again and again and again, but the enemy has the high ground, so they make no progress. They take, they take a little pause for the nighttime. Back to the book, the nighttime lasted three hours at most, with the glow of the sun continuing. So as soon as the day broke, we marched against the city. The river was crossed below the city. The suburbs on the northern side were stormed, set on fire, and burned up. My company's doctor, named Stubble, had his arm shot away in crossing the stream, and he died afterward. No longer could I pay attention to my comrades, and therefore knew not in what way they perished or were lost. Everyone fired and struck at the enemy in wild madness, and no one could tell whether he was in front in the middle or behind the center of the army. Finally, while cannonballs kept on raining out of the city, we stormed it. With the help of heavy cannon, most of the supporting piers on the high old city wall on which the Russians were defending themselves from the inside were partially destroyed. We broke through the gates, pressed from all sides against the city, and put the enemy to flight. When I entered the city, we went toward the cloisters and churches. They had many holy images and altars as ours do. The only difference was that there was no holy water. So he, there's so much fighting going on. It's so bad. He can't even keep track of who's dying and how they're dying. They don't know where the enemy is. Eventually, they pound the Russian positions hard enough with artillery that they're able to break through. And when they get in there, they, they go to visit the churches. And they're hoping that they can find some water. But they, the Russians even took the holy water. So there's nothing to drink. Back to the book. We resorted in the evening to the former camping ground. Here one saw the wounded men being brought together to be operated on in a brick kiln which lay on the heights above the city. Many arms and legs were amputated and bandaged. It all looked just like a slaughterhouse. On August 19th, the entire army moved forward and pursued the Russians with all speed. Four or five Hours farther up the river, another battle started, but the enemy did not hold out long, and the march now led towards Mashesik, called the so-called Holy Valley. From Smolensk to Mashesik, the war displayed its horrible work of destruction. All the roads, fields, and woods lay as though sown with people, horses, wagons, burned villages, and cities. Everything looked like the complete ruin of all that lived. In particular, we saw 10 dead Russians to one of our men, although every day our numbers fell off considerably. That line hit me pretty hard. Everything looked like the complete ruin of all that lived. And he's saying that for every one soldier that they had lost, they're finding Ted dead. 10 dead Russians and again that's another thing another tactic of the Russians they're just gonna draw you in and they've got people they've got massive numbers of people mm. and they're willing to fight nutrition warfare and give up their people as they surrender to do as much damage to the enemy as they can and what they're doing is they're spreading out the logistics train they've destroyed the support mechanism that you would use by going and eating what food was in the village they destroyed that they burned it all and so now your logistics train gets completely spread out over these horrible roads 
and that's how they know that's what the, that's the Russian tactic mm. and then and then when they once they've done that they wait for winter back to the book in such numbers were the Russians lying around that it seemed as if they were all dead God how I remembered the bread and beer which I had enjoyed at home with such an indifferent pleasure now however I must struggle half wild with the dead and living how gladly I would I renounced for my whole life the warm food so common at home if I only did not lack good bread and beer now I would not wish it for more all my life but these were empty helpless thoughts yes the thought of my brothers and sisters so far away added to my pain wherever I looked I saw the soldiers with dead half desperate faces many cried out in despair if only my mother had not borne me some demoralized men even cursed their parents and their birth Napoleon back to the book on September 7th every corps was assigned its place and the signal to attack was given like thunderbolts the firing began both against and from the enemy the earth was trembling because of the cannon fire and the rain of cannonballs crossed confusedly several entrenchments were storm and taken with terrible sacrifices but the enemy did not move from their place now the two armies moved more vigorously against one another and the death cries and shattering gunfire seemed a hell nine entrenchments were stormed the French threatened to surround the enemy from the front and finally the enemy gave way within a space of an hour and a half long and wide the ground was covered with people and animals there were groans and whines on all sides and that battle right there that he's talking about on September 7th that is the bloodiest single day of all the Napoleonic Wars there's about 250,000 men that attacked and there was 70,000 casualties in the first day and so I always refer to the, the Battle of the Somme where there were 60,000 casualties in the first 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And so here we go. That's, that's 70,000 in one day. Back to the book. We moved forward and camped by a forest on a height facing Moscow. It was a wood of green trees. Here, we not only had nothing to eat, but also no water to drink because of the high campsite and the road through the fields was still covered with dead Russians and this this is another interesting point that happened in this in this battle is you know I talked about how they destroyed everything destroy the fields kill all the livestock or drive them away and and make the people leave so there's there's just they're just barren wastelands also the governor of Moscow he opened up the prisons and let all these prisoners out I let all these people out of prisons just to just to add to the mayhem Mm. now going back to the book Napoleon refused the peace treaty proposed to him and that's actually that's what he says in the book and that's actually not what happened there was Alexander he didn't accept the peace offering so they got you know hey Napoleon said well you know we made it to Moscow do you want to have peace the guy says negative <laughs> you know Napoleon was probably gonna try and bargain for something but he gets told no mm-hmm. back to the book and the army which had advanced some 30 hours farther had uh, further on had to retreat because the Russian army stationed in Moldavia was approaching 
Now it was October 17th, and Napoleon held an army review and announced the departure for October 18th, early in the morning at 3 o'clock, with the warning that whoever should delay one hour would fall into the hands of the enemies. So now they're getting told, all right, you fought hard to get here. Now we're going to retreat. We're leaving at 3 o'clock in the morning. From Moscow, the road led south through Malo and toward Kaluga. Here the humanity of the commanders began to mount. Sorry, here the inhumanity of the commanders began to mount. The remaining troops' weapons were inspected, and many who did not have their weapons fairly rust free got 12 to 20 strokes with a club until they were near desperation. Needless to say, this is not good leadership. Hey, you want your people to you want your people to keep their weapons squared away, but if you're actually going to beat them and make them less combat effective, you better find a better solution for your situation. Here we go back to the book. The enemy attacked us. The enemy army behind us shattered all the army corps, leaving each of us then without his commanding officer. Those who were too weak to carry their weapons or, or knapsacks threw them away and all looked like a crowd of gypsies. Everything was in confusion, and during almost the whole night, the throng had to retreat to Moshesik, everyone running so as to not fall into the hands of the enemy. Because of these considerable losses, cannon, munition wagons, coaches, and baggage wagons by the hundreds had to be thrown into the water, and where that was impossible, all wagons were burned, not one wheel being permitted to remain whole. So now, as they're retreating, they've got to, they don't want to leave this stuff behind. So they're throwing it into the rivers and setting the wagons on fire as they're retreating in total, total disrepair and disorganization. The fighting, the shrieking, the firing of large and small guns, hunger and thirst, and all conceivable torments increased the never ending confusion. Indeed, even the lice seemed to seek supremacy, for their number on both officers and privates was in the thousands. In these days, it snowed for the first time, and the snow remained. The cold arrived at the same time, too, and the freezing of people multiplied the number of dead. No one could walk 50 paces without seeing death men stretched out half or completely dead similar situation that militaries seem to get into is lack of good winter clothing mm-hmm. it, it happens all the time and that's what happens here these guys are not prepared for this type of situation they're not prepared for this cold The distress mounted higher and higher, and horses were shot and eaten. Because I could not even get a piece of meat and my hunger came too violent, I took along the pot I carried, stationed myself beside a horse that was being shot, and caught up the blood from its breast. I set this blood on the fire, let it coagulate, and ate lumps without salt. The Russians advanced and waited us at Minsk. Everyone hastily fled. Cannon were thrown into the water. The hospitals were nearly all left to the enemy. And, as was commonly rumored, the hospitals were set afire and burned with their inmates. All the time, the greatest misery fell upon the poor sick, who usually had to be thrown from the wagons just to keep us from losing the horses and wagons entirely and who were left to freeze. Left to freeze among the enemies for whomever whomever remained lying behind could not hope to be rescued. The march had to go on and the striking, clubbing, and skirmishing commenced so frightfully that the cry of murder echoed all about. The Cossacks advanced upon the army from all sides. 
Again and again, people died and sometimes froze to death. These were people who pressed toward the fire, but were seldom permitted to get there. So they died away from the fire, and very often they were even converted into cushions in order that the living would not have to sit in the snow. It's this, this, you've got situations where you're not only fighting against the enemy, but they're also the troops are robbing and fighting each other and in some cases murdering each other and he talks about this and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more I kind of jumped into them and the fires and what happened was there's so little fuel for the fires that they would form teams of six to eight guys and gather up wood and then that team would sit around the fire and it's so cold that if you're not next to the fire you're gonna freeze to death but if you didn't participate in helping to build the fire, then you don't get to sit next to the fire. So if you were too weak, if you were too hungry, if you were too thirsty, and you couldn't do your carry your load and get firewood, you weren't gonna be permitted to sit next to the fire, which means you're gonna sit out there 20 feet from the fire and you're gonna freeze to death. Back to the book, in every biv- bivouac, soldiers who look like specters crept around at night. The color of their faces, their husky breathing, and their dull muttering were horribly evident. For wherever they went, they remained hopeless. And no one allowed these shades of death to drag themselves to the fire. Usually six, eight, or ten of us had to combine to build a fire since no other wood was to be had except rafter pieces from burned houses or trees lying around, shattered wagons, etc., and without the cooperation of the men, nothing could be accomplished. Neither did we dare to fall asleep at the fire at the same time because no one was safe from stealing and robbery. Officers were beaten away from the fire just as privates were whenever they tried to press forward without merited claim. Only mutual support still procured true friendship. So they didn't care anymore. If you're an officer, it doesn't matter. If you didn't put out and build this fire, you're not going to get close to it. And I mentioned very quickly Lice. And he, at one point, he hooks up with a major and they kind of become swim buddies trying to work together. And here we go to the book. We came to a lumber yard and built a fire there. When the major had become somewhat warm, his subjects. And by subjects, he's, he's referring to lice, plagued him with unusual wickedness. And for this reason, he asked me to kill the tormentors in his shirt collar. I did it. But when I had opened his collar, his raw flesh showed forth where the greedy beasts had gnawed in. I had to turn my eyes away with abhorrence and reassure the master that I saw nothing, telling him that my eyes hurt so much from the smoke that I could not see anything. These pests, however, were no less to be found on me, thousands of them. However, because of my constant restlessness, they could not get to the point of forcing me to treat them with flesh. So the lice is actually eating his friend, the major. And lice are no joke. It's like body lice. Yeah, body lice. Yeah, body lice. Like what kids get, like what your kids get from school. I don't know if your daughter's had it yet, but she will. Well, I remember back when we were in school, it'd be like in your hair. Yeah, for sure. For sure, that's where it starts. I don't think I've ever seen or, I mean, I heard of it. Yeah, and actually, I, I read that section to my wife because my wife, like all moms, absolutely despise lice yeah. because when they come home from school and it's just total nightmare, you gotta yeah. cl- everything's got to get squashed. And the, yeah, my yeah. daughters all had crazy, long, thick hair. Yeah, yeah. And Dang. so it would be hours of picking through that hair trying to get the lice out when, when, when that would break out. Yeah. But, you know, that's the thing is, you have the treatment for yeah, it, right? The shampoo. You whatever. have the shampoo and yeah. you have you you clean your clothing yeah. and so it's gone. But what happens if you don't do that? 
What happens if you don't do that? What happens if they don't have any shampoo? What, if, what happens if you have to wear the same clothes over and over and over and over again? And by the way, you can't take the clothes even off because you'll yeah. freeze to death. So what happens? You got a nice little home for the lice and they start to eat. Eat you. Yes. And, and also, and so this whole time, obviously they're retreating. They, they'd been defeated and they were retreating this whole time and they're still being attacked. They're still being attacked by the Russians. Back to the book, the Russians pressed nearer and nearer from every side and the murdering and tormenting seemed about to annihilate everyone. That day, we expected that everyone must be captured, killed, or thrown into the water. Everyone thought that his last hour had come and everyone was expecting it. And so they, they're, they're kind of trapped. And he's, that's what he's saying. He's expecting that everyone's dead. We're all going to die or get thrown in the water. And they get to a bridge. Mm-hmm. And there's actually two bridges. One of them gets destroyed. And now there's all these guys trying to get across one bridge to get to safety. They're being attacked. Back to the book. Everyone crowded together into a solid mass. And nowhere could one see a way out or a means of rescue. From morning till night, we stood unprotected from cannonballs and grenades, which the Russians hurled at us from two sides. At each blow, from three to five men were struck to the ground, and yet no one was able to move a step to get out of the path of the cannonballs. Only by filling up of the space where a cannonball made room could one make a little progress forward. I think that has to be one of the most insane situations that I've ever heard of. Mm. You're standing in a mass of people, hundreds and hundreds of people, trying to get across a bridge. It's very slow movement. You have nowhere to hide, and there's cannonballs from two sides that are ripping through the people, and the only progress you make is by stepping on and filling the holes of where these men have gone to the ground and died. And by the way, you're starving, thirsty, covered in lice, yeah, freezing. And this is always encouraging. Back to the book. Moreover, here in this region, Napoleon had left us and fled with the fresh reserve troops hurrying home ahead of the army. The general cry was, save himself who can. So again, myself included, we do a lot to glorify Napoleon, but here he is, his men are trapped, and a fresh group of reserves show up, and he hightails it out of there with the fresh reserves. He eventually gets across that bridge, and now they're just, they're just every man for himself, but it's not really every man for himself because they got to link up with a couple other people to, yeah. to support each other, to protect each other. Because it is, it's just chaos. Back to the book. It had been the fate of many hundreds when they sat down because of weakness or necessity that their clothing had been brutally torn from them and where they could not defend themselves, they froze to death naked. So now you got the choice. You know, oh, I see you. You got to stop. Either you're tired or you're weak or maybe you just got to stop and go to the bathroom. Well, I see you with your in a compromised state and I come over and just take your clothes from you. Rip them off you. Why? Because I want to be warm yeah. and it's you or me. Dang. And that's their, his own team. That's his own team. His own team right there. And it just again obviously like I always have to do with these books I mean it goes on and on and on and on brutal brutal back to the book by the end of December we reached the Polish border along the memo river now I was free and left to myself again as soon as I noticed a trail I rode as fast as I could and so now he's got a horse one day along the road, I came to a nobleman, nobleman's manor house at which I asked for bread and obtained not only bread, but also butter and brandy, for there was a servant there who could speak German. And, and so that's it. I mean, almost as quickly as it all started, once he gets back to Poland, he gets a horse 
and he rides until he finds a nice manor house and also it's not really a concentration of troops anymore that are showing up in these towns now it's small groups it's not like thousands of soldiers are coming in that need to be fed mm. it's dozens at a time and so there's actually the food and and necessary means to support small numbers of soldiers that are coming in and so it's it, I, w- I don't want to say it's anticlimactic but it is a little bit because once he gets back to Poland and gets a horse it's like it's over mm. and he g- gets a- escapes from all that pain and misery eventually gets to another town I came to Ortelsburg and for the first time was given regular quarters it was just Christmas Eve a date I would not have known if I had not learned it from the landlord here I also washed myself for the first time but I could not rid myself of the lice we met a column of Bavarians who were en route from Konigsberg to the gathering place at Plock. They told us the news that the Wurttembergers too were gathering in Thorn and that the Germans all had permission to go home. Hence, I was one of the last to come to Thorn. The same night, I lodged in a house and bought some bread and wine for free quarters were not to be thought of one could scarcely creep along the streets on account of the throngs of people early in the morning I traveled across the bridge and saw with astonishment that the city during this year of war had been developed into an important fortress however they had used only wooden walls and sand around the high walls I now grew weaker and weaker and only with great exertion did I reach the city. Here I reached the third convoy of our people and presented myself immediately to the commander who asked, where are you from? From the army was my answer. So you are also one of those Moscow bums, he retorted. And that was my welcome return. one of those Moscow bums so just to explain what those Moscow bums were they started with 685,000 men and had over 400,000 killed so that's almost 60% killed and I think what's what what this book gives me <laughs> is such a classic examples really of not only how to act but also how not to act mm. so for one from a leadership perspective keep your people informed of what is happening And that's one thing that struck me about this book. Oftentimes these guys had no idea what was happening, what was going on, what was the next move. They they did not know what was happening. Another thing, and this is clearly a lesson that we talk about all the time, is is you got to be humble. Hmm. Because from Napoleon's perspective, he thought he could pull this off, right? But he underestimated Russia's strength. He underestimated the time it would take. He underestimated the readiness of his own troops. He underestimated their strategy. So, again, lesson learned for the millionth time. Be humble. And then getting to this, this, uh, this, just that, that closing statement about Moscow bums. I think that is a great reminder to treat people with respect and we talked about this I think it was the last podcast or maybe the podcast before that doesn't mean you have to respect people because if you don't know them you can't just give away respect but you treat people with respect because you don't know what they've been through you don't know what struggles they've seen how would you know that and so when you throw out things like Moscow bum, 
and you don't know that this is a guy that's been actually through hell don't do that and the last thing you know again to take away from this book for me is to remember you know not just you in the business world of course remember your frontline people remember what grind they're going through remember what it feels like to them to be out on the job site or in the factory or on the front line doing sales remember what that is but also for everyone remember the actual frontline troops the suffering the fear the discomfort the cold and the wet and the hunger remember that reality of war and remember that it impacts those young soldiers and those young Marines remember them because it's really really easy to forget so I think that's all I've got from the diary of a Napoleonic foot soldier pretty epic read to hear that side of it yeah totally different from sitting here and reading Napoleon's maxims yeah and thinking yeah. about his wonderful brilliance yeah yeah bailing on his guys bailing on his guys oh fresh reserves are here cool I'm gonna use them to get out of here yeah yeah and you know I, I get it I was just reading another book uh, I can't I can't think of it off the top of my head but it was it was talking about you know as a leader you're supposed to stay alive right mm. like you can't take unnecessary risks as a leader you 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 can't be at the front of the assault you shouldn't be yeah. sometimes you have to be but you need to stay alive yeah and so maybe you could give napoleon a little credit there for that um but maybe not maybe not too much <laughs> yeah uh so this one time on Seinfeld where George <laughs> do you really want to go there right now <laughs> in a way because it, it sounds dumb but this that just what you said right there mm-hmm. though this because this seemed what like this seems like what Napoleon was like Seinfeld Seinfeld Napoleon. so George this Got real it. real kind of this guy a fire breaks out and he um, pushes over an old lady some kids you know to, to escape right? oh, to escape the fire right so everyone, after the fire, it, the fire, there was no fire. It was just some burnt, like, burgers oh. or something. So they're questioning him. <laughs> and he's like, and that's what he says, kind of what you just said there. He's like, I had to lead these people to safety. And if, you know, all is lost if the leader dies kind of thing. That's mm-hmm. what he was saying. Everyone's looking at him like, oh, my god. They're gosh, shaking she, their heads. Yeah, like, bro, we saw what you did. You know, you mm-hmm. stepped on the old lady going out kind of thing. So it kind of, it's kind of that deal. I think that's what Napoleon did. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you. And it's... You know, and then in the Navy, the the captain of the ship goes down with the ship. Right. That's right? like the old at school, least, right? At least he's the last guy off. Yeah. At least, at a bare minimum, he's the last guy off. But yeah. so oftentimes he goes down with the ship because he's trying to fight it and save it the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's Napoleon kind of the old not, saying. didn't carry that out. But no. he came back from this and got exiled and everything was, you know, ru- his life was ruined. Sure. But you'd sound like he ruined a hell of a lot more lives than just his own. With this experience yeah interesting how he they kept mentioning the lice you know like yeah that's, that's good when they do that because it really does give you a feel of like yeah. you know you know how, uh, it's a little thing yeah seems like no big deal yeah but Until it's constantly lice. constantly there. there boom boom or the hunger or the cold when it's just constantly there because you don't really think of that you know you yeah. think of the firefight and the bombs and the you know those big things yep. but the, all those little things adding up it's like yeah because the lice are constant eating just you. constantly eating you is that what lice does eat eats yeah you? i eats guess your so skin? i don't know too much about lice yeah, i just know I that know. my wife freaks out when they come in the house yeah which when you got four kids 
there was times where we just had you know a lice epidemic in the house yeah, i'd come yeah. home and it looked like uh ghostbusters showed up and were <laughs> securing the property quarantine yeah quarantine Jeez. but yeah. you didn't have that opportunity for these guys yeah yeah you just like you pick up some of that stuff in all these books what those soldiers are suffering through yeah you know whether it's uh you know jungle foot foot rot trench foot yeah you, you just your feet are getting destroyed yeah. by the weather or you, know, you get the sores on your back just all these things all yeah. these things you like Travis Mills remember he was talking about how um, the, the salt stuff on on, oh, yeah. on your back or whatever the salt crystals forming on yeah. your back. It's like, no one told me about that yeah. and I heard you know a lot of my friends have been to com no one talked about that kind yeah. of stuff you know they were hot and sweaty for a long period of time with no showers yeah so it's just and just humans collecting. don't humans aren't you you're not used to that yeah. you're not used to you, people aren't used to that we're used to shower every day yeah you know hell yeah fresh bar of soap Two times a day sometimes yeah if you're training it but you you can't get used to it. it's like your feet yeah. right you know some people are barefoot all the time like my son he's yeah. barefoot all the time he can sprint on jagged rocks with yeah. no effect yeah he doesn't even notice it it's like tarzan so it is on Kauai. yeah I'm with me fun. i'm all sensitive <laughs> you know the feet because i gotta wear shoes yeah. and i try and try and harden them up when i can but when yeah. i lately i've been on the road too much my feet are weak dang bro weak yeah makes oh. me angry when i see my son sprinting across jagged <laughs> rocks as if it's nothing Yep, tougher than you bro yeah dang that makes me mad <laughs> I, can see that. I can't even fake it either. No, you know what I mean. You yeah. try and act all tough mm -hmm. when you're walking. Yeah, try and act like it's not hurting. Yeah, but it hurts. Yeah, yeah. I had that too Weak. when I when I moved here from Kauai. I had that where my really? feet were all tough because yeah, you go barefoot. So you wear slippers all the time. You go barefoot everywhere. But slippers are different, bro. For those of you that don't know Hawaiian, flip slippers flops. are flip flops. Yeah. But fl flip flop, I wear flip flops all the time too. Yeah, but it's totally different. Right, than but barefoot. you don't take them off all the time. No. So it, here's to give you an idea of how common being barefoot is. On in elementary school, I went to school with no shoes on mm -hmm. before, and no one said anything. Mm -hmm. And if you go to school with shoes on, you take them off immediately because you go run around and recess and stuff like that. You don't. You just yeah. don't. Did I ever tell you that story about my son? Mm -mm. So my son was homeschooled for a while. Sure. And when he was homeschooled, he was he would surf a lot, <laughs> even by even by his standards sure. or my standards. Yeah. But one time he cut his foot on the reef, mm -hmm. and he came up to the house, and my wife says, "You know, hey, go clean that out, put a bandaid on it, put on some socks and shoes." Mm -hmm. And he says, "No." And my wife says, "What?" He says, "No." She says, "Hey." Go clean that out, put a Band-Aid on it, and put on some socks and shoes now. Otherwise, it's going to get dirty. He's like, no. She says, hey, go and put a Band-Aid on that, clean it off, put a Band-Aid on it, put on socks and shoes. And he says, I can't. And she says, why not? And he says, I don't have any shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so it had been, since he was homeschooled, it had been a really long time. And since he had had to wear shoes yeah, yeah, yeah and so he had outgrown his shoes so it had been months <laughs> since he had had shoes yeah no need to buy them yeah right? don't need those Just things why are you doing those things <laughs> so so yeah after that it was we i did i when i got home i had to she says hey go take him to get shoes i said why he says he need shoes because he cut his foot on the reef okay well we had to get him shoes gotta get some shoes but yeah now. so same thing as you Barefoot just he was just barefoot all the time and he's still yeah. barefoot a lot of the time. Yeah, tough that's why feet. his feet are tough Yeah, so Indian feet and then now, you know, you come to the mainland where you wear shoes all the time And we don't wear shoes in the house in Hawaii. That's a thing and so still, you know, but if you have like a carpet or something like that the Feet get soft. Yeah yep. Bummer Amen Well remember those little things that yeah, the people fun. out on the front lines are are putting up with and suffering through on a daily basis yeah kind of seems like that book escalated quickly with the hardship it, it, it did and I, I think it caught everyone off guard yeah yeah yeah. again I, I like to try and think about the guy the guys back then and they're thinking ah oh, cool you know I've been working at my whatever crappy job I have and then all of a sudden adventure time yeah yeah and good food time why and, and get treated like bread. a hero time yeah 
and and then they roll into the Russian campaign, and it's no, not, it's not so cool. much. Yeah. It's actually the exact opposite. <sighs> yeah, one second you're eating bread and butter and wine. What was it, brandy? Brandy, Both. wine, cheese. And then the next minute you're killing your friend for his clothes. Yeah, because you gotta and live. Yeah, I didn't cover some of those sections where he's getting robbed. They're gonna kill him. I mean, he's own guys. Yeah, you know, or different. There's another little, you know, because it's French soldiers and there's some German soldiers that are on the same side. But what do you think happens when things go crazy? All of a sudden, they start forming their own the gangs, right? Yeah, they're gonna yeah, stick together. How, yeah, horrible, horrible. Well, speaking of crappy jobs, <laughs> yeah, maybe you could. Do a crappy job of telling us how we could support this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'd prefer if you did a good job. I'm gonna try to do my best. Oh, back to that what you were just saying. The, the uh, um, you know, you form into little gangs. Yeah. In times of. Did that happen in Hawaii too? No. On Seinfeld. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, I kind of. I'm gonna say it anyway. No, there's this movie. It's called The Divide. I think it's called The Divide. I'm pretty sure. It's like this weird movie mm -hmm. and some apocalyptic thing happens in the beginning mm -hmm. and everyone like retreat in this apartment building retreats to the basement where the superintendent or somebody lives and this guy is uh, uh he's like a one of these doomsday prepper type mm -hmm. dudes you know yeah. and and i think he even <laughs> has a man <laughs> a manual or something he wrote a man i don't know so Did they all go anyone? down but it's everybody it's like you know a pre a girl with the, uh, her daughter um you know some dudes some you yeah, know whatever. they got Just the broad cross section of society exactly that's, right I, I don't i haven't seen the movie but i know the plot line yeah, exactly. cool <laughs> check <laughs> But that's what they, that's essentially what the movie is about right there, where everyone's just, we're all just people, right? We all live in this building. Yeah. We're all kind of, and then they start to just divide into um, oh. teams and groups and they fight and, and the harder stuff gets, the more violent it gets. Yeah. So they end up like killing each other in all these ways. Like certain people have certain assets so they can offer like value to this group, you know, kind of mm. thing. And it's all within like- Who becomes this. the dominant group? The dominant- evil group is uh, is these just two friend guys I, the person who lives is just the one girl only one girl lives yeah everyone else dies in one way or another yeah mm. it's it's a weird movie, spoiler alert but yeah <laughs> it, it it's weird because you don't know like who caused the bomb you know and all that well, so there's a it's great not book about by that. cormac mccarthy called the road this is a book it's not a movie well there actually there is a movie yeah but you don't know what happened there either. Just everything is different now. And it's different and gray and dark and everything's dead. Yeah. There's like nothing living. Yeah. No plants are living. Nothing's living. Yeah. And there's humans kind of wandering and, yeah, and trying to trying to survive. It's yeah. a great book. But yeah. But yeah, that's the the movie essentially they just kinda omit all these details. Like that doesn't make sense. That's why the movie's weird, but when you think about it, that's what the movie's about. We should put Cormac McCarthy The Road on the website for people to uh, uh to get see what else. Along with the diary of a Napoleonic Foot Soldier, so people can get this. This would be a hard one to get. I don't know, it's a rare book. I don't even know where I got it from. Check. Yeah. Where yeah. So either somebody mailed it to me, which I appreciate if it was you. Let me know, or I just had it. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. My books are out of control right now. Yeah, yeah. It's good, man. You have a dope little collection. Yeah, <laughs> it's not too little anymore. Cool. Well, support. I'll try my best here to not do a crappy job. To not do a crappy job. So, origin. Talk about origin. Originmain.com. That's where you can go for all the cool origin stuff. Supplier of. Yes, Jocko has supplements. Jocko supplements. Krill oil, joint warfare. Two very good. Essential. I would say essential. Yeah. Like if you're working out and stuff. Actually, somebody asked me yesterday which someone said, hey, on a budget, got sore joints. Krill oil or joint warfare? That's a hard question. That might be the hardest question I've gotten on the podcast. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I honestly, I take them both all the time. Yeah. So I don't know which one. It is the, the better, the better one. one. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what I recommended though? I said joint warfare. Yeah, because I know the joint warfare. I have noticed specifically my shoulders jacked up, and the joint warfare it was like healing 
so with that I said hey go with the joint warfare yeah at least to start with if you can get both yeah for sure and I I would say and I couldn't I couldn't that. do muscle ups for like six months oh cuz your shoulder yeah yeah that's jacked up man yeah and, and you know me I don't even say anything. I just I work around it. Like for a while, I couldn't do any kipping pull-ups. I could only do dead hang pull-ups. Why? That was the same as my shoulder. It yeah. was my shoulder. Like huh. I couldn't. Whatever. I don't know why. Maybe and and you know, I would go see. Sometimes I go see physical therapists, yeah. and I try and explain to them what's going on. And they they try and overlay their 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 they try and overlay their vision of my problem onto yeah. me. Yeah. Based like, on like for instance, other it makes no saw. sense that kipping pull-ups would hurt but dead hang pull-ups wouldn't right why right. does that make sense yeah that's what happened <laughs> yeah, that's what's going you, you on you know what i mean regardless i yeah. could do ring dips but i couldn't do ring muscle ups i couldn't do them because mm. it was injured yeah. so um you know and I, I all i do is i i modify the workout as best i can you know and i for a while i was only doing dead hang pull-ups yeah. and so i would do weird things i do dead hang all different grip pull-ups i do dead hang weighted pull-ups mm. i did all kinds of different things to get through it but i still like to do kipping pull-ups and eventually now I can do muscle ups again and I can it's it was, it was hurt for I'd say it's hurt for it was hurt for about six months But I've been back in the game now for I don't know. How'd you do it? How'd I do what the shoulder? Hurt, yeah, no idea Just, oh, just yeah, like yeah. G- general use General usage <laughs> Bro, that's, Greg was Greg hurt his back messed it up. Yeah, too, I know, by I, know. The way. I saw him yesterday. You know how he did it? Yeah, opening the window in his bed <laughs> from his bed and his wife locked the window. I know, man. His wife I locked like, the window. He's telling me and I was laughing and I think he thought he might have thought I was like laughing at him like, oh, mm-hmm. you're getting old kind of thing. But I was laughing at that. I was laughing at just the idea of injuring your back really bad yeah. by laying in bed. Yeah. Opening a window. That's you know? that's like people telling you get after it. If you weren't <laughs> in bed and you know, he was trying to let cool air in, right? He's too yeah. hot. So he's trying yeah. to get more comfort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more comfort than it's laying like, in bed. That's irony, right? That's yeah. what that is. I I don't even want to. I'm gonna knock on wood because like I don't I don't even say anything when someone gets injured. Man, I hate it because yeah. I hate being injured. That's yeah. the weird thing too is when you get injured, you think that injury. It seems like the injury is gonna last forever. Yes. I always have that feeling like this yeah. is just never gonna go yeah, away because you, you don't out. notice yeah. these incremental little things. But when you get injured. If you remember the fact that there's tiny tiny incremental progress being made and you keep working and keep doing it Eventually, it's gonna heal and you'll be joyous again. Yeah, yeah, and you, you'll be joyous again You appreciate that too, you know, like when you're out and you're like Freaking I remember that day when I was fully not injured Yeah, and I just chose to not go train or not but then when you're injured you're like, oh my god. Yeah You do what you can People ask me that all the time. How do you, what do you do when you get injured? Do what you can. Do what yeah. you can. That's what I did. Like I couldn't do muscle ups. Okay, cool. I would do ring dips. I would do other. I would do every other exercise around muscle ups, yeah. except for muscle ups themselves, because I couldn't do them at that time. Yeah. Now I'm back in the game. Back in the game, big time. Kipping pull ups are back. Got that joint warfare. Yeah, got the jo- yeah joint warfare. Boom. Get it. Yep. And krill oil. I, and telling you, I, I think I think you should do both. That's what that's what my opinion is. And yeah. that started for me years ago when I went on krill oil and glucosamine chondroitin. Right. And now, of course, we have it yeah. in the glorious super krill. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Joint yeah. warfare. Yeah. And you're supporting the podcast, which is cool. Yeah. So that's a good one. Get that for your joints. Um, also, geese and rash guards. A lot of times, people when they start jujitsu, and this actually this this was going on since the beginning. People be like, what gi should I get? Yeah. And let's be, at the time, I was like, okay, and actually Origin was one of them, but mm-hmm. I didn't know as much about Origin. Right. I was like, yeah, they're cool. And then the one I saw was like kind of expensive. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, Origin's cool if you want the high-end one and stuff like that, and it was cool. But Origin has all levels. No, actually not true. They don't have all levels. What do you mean? If you want to get a $28 gi, no, okay. Not you can't. That, you can't get a low level. level gi. Yeah, you can get medium or or awesome. Yeah. So okay, it's a good point. So yeah. the medium is because the first gi I ever bought was forty dollars. Yeah. See, I I have never. It lasted with. three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I bought one for ninety nine dollars, and 
it was yeah it was really really bad yeah and i don't even know the the brand i don't yeah. even know if it had a brand but yeah it shrunk to the point where it like it fit normal and it shrunk all almost up to my elbow <laughs> by the way yeah and so to me if the next one i want to say was like 120 it was like a regular yeah. one of these brands i don't know i forget yeah. and it was fine oh i know the brand i'm not gonna say it to hate on it but it to me it shrunk and it wasn't yeah. that cool nonetheless now that i have a or origin gi have two of them by the way they are way better and i'm not i know just you're looking at me like it just sounds like oh i got this and it's way better the thing is it is no they it are. is straight yeah. up way better yeah and they have different kinds of weaves or whatever but they have the and really the point there is when people ask me and if you're wondering what gi to get go on the, go on the website and you can see whichever you know like if you if you're like hey i want the f- cadillac one <laughs> which i recommend by the way because it's extra dope um, or or you know you just want the regular one they're all good quality all made in america too by the way and rash guards rash guards yeah pete just sent me three rash did he guards. send you the <laughs> <laughs> that thing is dope one of the ones uh, american made american hands yeah, oh, yeah that your one's hand. cool. but wait did he send you the other one he didn't send it to you which one does it has i'll give you a hint it says it's got the chemical formulation for soda on it do you have that one <laughs> no, no okay no, no, yeah. you'll see it yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, saw, I saw some samples but yeah some good rash guards and they fit good too so and again I, i'm not going to say the, the brand name but this is a, a very good kind of high-end mm-hmm. combat sports brand rash guards geese uh, i'm not gonna say the name because it doesn't matter because it's a ma- matter of opinion anyway so mm-hmm. i want to influence that way but i got some rash guards and i was like cool they look dope and i'm, I'm like cool but you put it on and it's it just didn't work out, you know? <laughs> like, it, I can't wear this because just how it fits and stuff like that. Was so. it baggy? Uh, it was baggy in No way. I was, I was, I was actually areas. trying to make a joke. Yeah. Because, like, if you have a baggy rash card, dude, you need to start jacking some steel. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> you need to start I agree deadlifting with that. and squatting <laughs> if your rash card's baggy. I, I agree with that. But it was weird because it was baggy in certain areas, you know? Yeah, that is weird. I don't know. Either way, originmain.com. It's some cool stuff. Also, it's made in America. No big deal. Yeah. From beginning to end. <laughs> yeah. too. It's just funny. You just said the whole thing. But the actual one of the best things about origin is made in America. That's yeah, that's awesome. In my opinion. Yeah. With American hands. Well, then again, I don't know. Think about this. What if it was all made in America? It was, you know, then the legit from from the cotton grown all the way to the end product. But when you get it, the rash guard fits all baggy oh, in yeah, certain yeah. areas. Well, no, I don't know. Kind of defeats the yeah. purpose, really. Well, yeah. Look what happened with cars in America in the eighties, right? People started buying Japanese cars because the American quality. They wanted to buy America, but the American quality wasn't there. It's yeah. back now. Yeah. But it's, at that time period, yeah, your 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 rear view mirror was gonna fall <laughs> off. <laughs> Bumper. Yeah. It's kind of like you know how I don't know if you ever had a had a friend or something, or maybe yourself. You start like a clothing brand. Right. I remember back when I first started jujitsu, like everyone, that was kind of like the thing. Start a clothing brand. Start jujitsu. Month three, start a clothing, clothing brand. brand. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of like the joke, you know? And so uh, a lot of people, they, not a lot, I don't want to say a lot of people, but some people, they hear, you know, then you, that, that's kind of the, the textbook process. You start your brand, you give away right. your stuff to key people, and, you know, hopefully it kind of takes hold and takes off. So. Sometimes I'd get the shirt and the designs are cool for the time. They were cool. But then when you put on the shirt, it doesn't like fit correct or, mm-hmm. you know, because when they got the blanks, yeah, they just were like, hey, I got to cut Print costs. Them. Hey, it's a blank black shirt. Yeah. You know, what's the difference kind of thing? But the thing is, there is a difference. Mm-hmm. At the end, when you put it on, bruh, the design can be <laughs> outstanding. But if no one's going to wear it, man, who cares? So who knows? Check. But it is a big deal, made in America from the cotton all the way to the end product. That is a big deal. Yeah. And that's on top of the fact that the product is perfection. Concur. Also, speaking of fitness, being fit, were we talking about being fit? Not really, but you go with it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, we were. A muscle ups and joint warfare. That's okay. what I was thinking yeah, yeah. about. True, yeah, true. Yeah. So, kettlebells, I'm into them. I think that this is just me because I'm spoiled, but the kettlebells from on it, 
And, you know, there's like copycat brands. Mm. You know, they do that. I'm not saying with kettlebells specifically. Are there copycat uh, artistic I kettlebells? Don't, here's the thing. I, I haven't don't, seen them. I don't know if there's they're specifically copycat. Because there, there's other ones, yeah, for mm. sure. There's oh, okay. like a skull one and like this, this other ones. Hmm. But if my head was a kettlebell, how much would it weigh? <laughs> I don't know, bro. probably yeah, uh, eighty-eight pounds. Probably. I'd love to be the heavy one. Uh, yeah, I saw one that's like dumb heavy, like it's dumb. Like, Over one hundred and three. Like, yeah, it's like two hundred something pounds. Yeah. Oh, that's big. Yeah, it's Dang. Like a skull one. Someone sent it to me on Twitter. Oh, I thought they sent it to you in real life. I was no. like, come and take it from your house, <laughs> bro. You know the meal. I buy it like when um. You know, okay, so wh- how I did it was I got the, the chimp, right? It's mm-hmm. like 35 pounds or something yeah. like that. So I get two of them. And d- that's when I started kettlebells. So they're like, start start lighter. Mm-hmm. lighter. So they didn't like, mean 35, dude. Yeah. Well, but whatever. Wait, is that too light or yeah. not light enough? Not too light. Well, well, bro, I, when I started, I was like, this is appropriate. Mm-hmm. I got to be careful even with this because I had never really done it. I picked it. it up and, you know, so I was staying safe. And I was like, cool, formulated a good workout. Now it's time to get the bigger ones, right? So I went up to, they're out of the one I wanted. So I went all the way up to the werewolf, which is like 62 pounds. That's good. So I'll start Solid. doing that with that. Got good at that. Boom, boom, boom. So... But keep in mind, I'm getting them from on it. Like I, I don't, I, I have the luxury of getting like the the good ones. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm all spoiled. So I'm over here, like I'm about to say, hey, everyone should have the design one because it's like cooler and I don't know. You get kind of, you know how like when you get like a new cool rash guard, right? Something with a cool design on it. Yeah. You want to wear it and use it. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's kind of that. You get that. No, so I don't you get, get more emotional about up. that kind of stuff. Yeah, you do whatever, bro. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Anyway, um, yeah. Primal bells, zombie bells, and legend bells. Those are the ones. Cool jump ropes on there too, by the way. And other fitness stuff. Interesting fitness stuff. And um, again, the kettlebells. I recommend the kettlebells, but like me, start light. Don't swing it and hit your shin, mm. stuff like that. You yeah, just you, can, be you can jack yourself up. Yeah, there's some technique involved. Yeah, and you don't recognize that the momentum of swinging a kettlebell is a real thing. Yeah, and then it only it. weighs 35 pounds in your case, but when you swing it to the top of, and then you have to stop that thing, it's not weighing 25 pa- 35 pounds anymore. It's got momentum. Yeah, and then when you stop, it's got centrifugal it's still force. Swinging. Yes. So you you know the one where it's like a regular snap. I guess it's not a snatch, but the clean. Yeah. You know, you go up and it's yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, they yeah, call clean. the rack position. Right, right. So even that, I've seen it done. So I'm like, oh, I can do that. I'll just use it light. But I'm doing it wrong. I'm like flipping it, flipping it up uh, where it lands on the back of my wrist, and then it like pulls my shoulder back. So I'm Americana. like, how do they do this? I was like, oh, I just gotta use. But then I looked it up on YouTube, the actual technique, and then I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I almost but, chipped my tooth the other day with uh, <laughs> doing front squats uh, with a kettlebell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just I just like lifted it up really hard because I was flying. going from the picking it from the floor to like up to the to the position to start squatting, and I like did it so hard that I hit my front tooth. Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> idiot. Straight up kettlebell. Yeah. Rather that thing. Yeah, they can be Dan. Just be careful. That's the point. Anyway, on it. dot com slash Jocko. Check them out. Those are cool ones. They have the regular ones too, but. I don't know, man. Once you have the design one, you can't go back, my opinion. Not that I have any basis for comparison because I've never had the normal <laughs> ones, but I've seen them in other gyms, used them before, and it's not the same, my opinion. Also, if you want to get this book, The Diary of Napo- uh, Napoleonic Foot Soldier. There you go. Or any books that Jocko talks about. Or Wright's author, by the way. We have direct links to all these books per episode on our website, jockopodcast.com. This is the book, the book sec- section. It's books from the episodes, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, go on there, click through there. Not only is it organized, you can find the correct book that you're looking for. It supports the podcast. Or if you're doing any other shopping that day or that moment or whatever, boom, carry on. Good way to support. Also, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, all these podcasting providing platforms. And YouTube, by the way. YouTube, uh, on top of the video version of this podcast, as we all know, we have little excerpts that you can share. So you don't have to share the whole thing. Or it's just more of a chance someone's going to listen to what you're sharing. What else should we put on YouTube? 
What else? I think I should we? put stuff on YouTube because right. I think I could do it more frequently than you. No, actually, <laughs> maybe not because I do it th- three times a week if you count the podcast. Really? Yeah. Monday, really? Friday. I've I've gotten into a good routine. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. I'll look into that. For the most part. Okay. I still think maybe I should do something. I want to do something like, can you do live on YouTube? Yes. I need to do that. Yeah. I don't know how, I've never done it before, but Joe Rogan does it all the time. Oh, yeah. Live. Yeah. YouTube live stuff. Nonetheless, subscribe to the YouTube. There's some, uh, also deleted scenes. That's what we put on there. Maybe not as often, but if you want to see some behind the curtain, <laughs> right? That's yeah. the expression. Behind the scenes. If you want to hear me swear. Stuff. Because yeah. apparently yeah, I, really I just swear. unleashed a bunch of swear yeah. words on the yeah. uh, Skinny Knees yeah, skinny. podcast. Sure. I was swearing Getaway earlier stick. today, pre-recording today sure. as well. I forget what we were talking about, but it was something that made me feel the urge to swear. Something emotional. What was it? I don't know. I don't we were know. talking about we'll a few have, things. We'll have to check the deleted scenes. Yeah, we'll get, go to the videotape. X, X or R-rated. Sure. Not X-rated. No, no, no. <laughs> Thankfully. That's like nudity and whatnot. And whatnot, sure. <laughs> that yeah. won't be on there. Yeah, no, no, afraid not. Um, also, so yeah, that's YouTube. YouTube, subscribe if you haven't already. If you're into YouTube, I'm saying that's a good way to support. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. Go to JockoStore.com. Makes sense, right? That's where you can get <laughs> shirts, our shirts, you know, the podcast shirts, Discipline Equals Freedom, all this stuff. Some cool ones on there. Um look at those and if you want something get something we also have women's stuff on there for the lady troopers out there Mm. or the guys you know your wife daughter sister mom boom Dave Burke hit me up he was like my wife wants some shirts Mm -hmm. I said you got it check no worries she's in the game yep Uh, some patches on there hoodies the heavier hoodies I got them. They're live? They're not live right <laughs> oh, now. But what, what? Why are you teasing everyone, man? <laughs> the, they'll on. be live this week, 100%. Okay. How about that? This okay. week. Good. 100%. Heavy. Heavy. New England. For New England people, yes. Minnesota. For everybody. They're for everybody. Minnesota. 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 Chicago. Yep. Michigan. All them. Michigan. Canada. Because when you're up there, you, 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 sometimes you just wear that. Just That's what you wear. Yeah. That's all I used to wear when I was a kid. Yeah. From... Like November until March. Just yeah. a heavy hoodie. That's yeah. it. Get some. Can't relate. Not the hoodie that you made last year. <laughs> the Kauai version. <laughs> that's not even the Kauai version. It's like the that's like that's the, the Big so- Island it's like, yeah, Mauna Kea it's, version. It's not even SoCal version. That thing was too light for SoCal. Nah, it was SoCal medium. summer. Yeah, I guess maybe. Yeah, it was like medium. I guess maybe, yeah. Looking forward to heavy. Yeah, heavy's good. Um, yeah, so yeah, hoodies on there. Other stuff, check it out. JockoStore.com. That's a good way to support. Hats too, right? Hats You're on there, You're supposed to yes. get me hats. Yeah, but the, yeah, the, the, hat, but the, hat, the hat's I not for you. Know. The hats are for the people. No, but I need hats too. Uh, there's some hats on there. Oh, you you need hats? Go to JockoStore.com. Oh, okay, cool. I'll go. check that out. There you go, bro. <laughs> <laughs> also, psychological psychological warfare, good way to support yourself. Good way to help yourself. Good way to spot yourself. On your journey. I'm going back to journey. I'm saying journey now. On your journey slash campaign against weakness. Like, you know, you're on the program now. You're waking up early now. You're working. Out. You got a workout program five days. I don't know. Three you know it's interesting you use the word program. This is interesting. Uh, Leif and... The Delta Platoon commander Seth Stone back in the day They like asked me for uh, like what I did for workouts. Yeah, and I wrote out my workouts and it's actually Loosely they're in they're in the discipline equals freedom field manual yeah. But when I gave it to him it just said at the top of the thing it said the program Yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually I really like that expression and I've been using it from it's like one of those things, you know how you always say, uh, discipline will not allow that? Yeah. I'll say, I'm on the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? well, I program. don't even know what the, program. You know, it's but just, you I'm the on. The program. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The, right. program. the program. Exactly right. So if you're on the program, which really life is, you should be on the program. Really? Yeah. If you're not, you're just like, what? You're like short term. You're not on the program. Hunting, we really. know that. Yeah, yeah. It's bad. And sometimes you don't even realize that you're not on the program. I think that's the problem. 
you don't even realize you're not on the program. Yeah, if, well, if you've never been on the program, then you right. don't know that you're not on it. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what, what does JP call it? Like, in, in unconsciously comp- incompetent or something like that. You know, he has all the things, all the psychological states oh. in learning. I don't know. Either way, if you don't know you're not on the program, you don't even know what you don't know kind of thing. Got you know, it. That kind of thing. Anyway. Got it. Back to the program. If you're on the program, but you experience those days, those moments of weakness... And you want Jocko to get you through him, help you through him, like a little spot. He's not going to take over, but as a spot, you listen to psychological warfare for your moment of weakness. And it goes by situation, right? Waking up, <laughs> there's like waking up one, there's a missing workout one, there's procrastination one. There are all these, what it is, is an, it's an album with tracks. Each track is for each weakness that you may or may not come across. That's good. Yeah. So as we got into and and that a lot of people like that album. Yeah. And so when Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual was being created. Sure. The the normal option is you publish books on audible dot com and then they put together the book with chapters that you can listen to through the Audible app. It's very confined to that. Yeah. So for the field manual, I, I the way the field manual is written, it's not written like a book. Mm-hmm. It's more like an album yeah. that you'd need to use with tracks. With tracks. So yeah. anyways, to make a long story short, we are going to make another psychological warfare album. But in the meantime, we put out Discipline Equals Freedom field manual, which is the book that just came out. And if you're looking for an audible version of that, you have to go to iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, everywhere, everywhere much. that they, Spotify, that they sell like, MP3 tracks, albums yeah. with tracks, and that's where you can get Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual audio version. And that that one makes a lot more sense though with with it this way. Oh, for sure, because it is like a manual. You know how like yeah, but yeah, and the thought was I didn't want to put it on an Audible book, the Audible format. Because then people can't put it on their alarm clock. They can't. They can't just jump through it and listen to that track. They can't put it into their playlist while they're working out. Yeah. So therefore, not use. Not not good. Not as useful. Yeah. So I know we're not going to sell as many because when it's linked right there on the website on Amazon, people can click right to it. So we're not going to sell as many, but it's better anyways. Doesn't matter. I'd rather I'd rather put out good product. Yeah. That's my concern. And especially when you're referring to it, because that's really what a manual does. Keep your money. (laughs) Audible. (laughs) Sure. No, because think of the link sure. would be right there, you know, because how Where? many people, so many, the okay, on Amazon, right it says formats oh, okay. for the book, gotcha. you know, hardcover, yes. and then Kindle, uh, Kindle, and Audible. then Audible, gotcha. mine doesn't have that, nope. so people can't click on it, and they ask me, they've been asking me on Twitter, when's the Audible, cover? are you going to do an Audible one, and I just have to respond to everyone, it's on blah, 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 gotcha, yeah, so, again, we're just, I'm more concerned that people that have it can utilize it properly, yeah, and I use Audible for sure, I do, but not as much. I use Kindle, that's where I read mm. books, the, the actual like reading part of it. Oh, it's a long story, but th- this with the tracks, hmm. <laughs> it is better because when you want to refer to, you know how yeah. like it's like, okay, I want to go to the martial arts part or right. the, you know, all this, uh, these other parts. When you want to refer to it, it's going to be, th- I'm thinking back with the audible format, it's going to be harder to be like, okay, you let me go and find yeah, it. You, you're not going to enjoy doing that effectively. Yeah. Yeah, but it is good to to you know listen to if one listen to one whole book from end end for sure. Whole, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hit it up. Yeah, but, but it, it does make more sense when you think about the whole scope. Yeah, of the discipline equals freedom field manual. So Body if yeah, operation. if you get the opportunity to tell people that and tell them because I can't tell everyone I tried. Yeah, that but where a, you can find it. Here's the here's the thing though. Ultimately, it's not hard to get. I mean, it's no, it's it, not hard to get it's at all. It's just not on the same. It's just not as where the, you'd expect it, and people yeah. f- expect to find things where they expect to find things. Yeah, yeah, that's and so true. So we've thrown them a curveball. Yeah, a little. Bit, you know, I guess. but it's it's like I said, it, to produce something that would be less usable by people in the manner that they want to use it, or make it a little bit harder to find. Like, like I said, maybe not as many people can buy it because they won't find it. I don't care. I'd rather have the people that really want it get to use it the way they want to use it. Throw them that's, a curve that's how I roll. The slowest curveball in the history of curveballs. <laughs> yeah. Here, get it on ice. Yeah, here, you have to do an extra click. 
<laughs> You'd be surprised yeah. how many people have asked on social media when it where when it's coming out. Oh, right, in audio format. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that does make sense though, yeah. especially if you're used to listening For to sure. audiobooks yeah. and you're like, okay, I want to. This is a book, right? Where's yeah, the audio? It book. totally makes exactly. sense. It's audible curveball. Yeah, literally, that is a curveball. That's true. I dig it. Uh, hey, while you're on Amazon, also you can get Jocko White tea, which tastes good and will guarantee you a deadlift of 8,000 pounds. <laughs> uh, some other books you can get on there are Way of the Warrior Kid. That's for kids that want to get after it. Or even if you want your kid to get after it, you want to be smarter, stronger, better. You want to eat healthier. Get them that book. Awesome feedback on that book, which is some of my favorite feedback is pictures of kids reading Way of the Warrior Kid. Doing pull-ups, I saw. And doing pull-ups, and doing jujitsu. Yeah. And doing flashcards, and their little book yeah. reports. I like seeing little book reports. Here's a, Remember, yeah, it's like when you time. do a book record, report when you're seven years old, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. It's like you're getting published for the first time as yeah. an author. You're like, <laughs> In boom. A way, yeah. you're like, hey, yeah. well, I wrote this. Yep. This is my assessment of yep. the book, Way of the Warrior Kid. Probably the most important thing that's ever been written. Check it out. And I also drew a picture. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Sure. That's Uncle Jake right there. You yeah. can't hardly tell because it doesn't look anything like him, but right. <laughs> it's supposed to be Uncle Jake. Yeah. Art's yeah. not my thing over here. But yeah, I like seeing those little things. Uh, we got the book Extreme Ownership, written by myself and my brother Leif Babin, and it is about combat leadership. Discipline equals Freedom Field Manual. Yes, the book that just came out, and thanks everyone for getting it, for spreading the word, for I like a bunch of people have put on stacks. They're getting it not just for them because they're on the path. They're on the program. On the program. They, they want to get their friends on the program. Yeah. They want to get their work person. They want to get their kid on the program. Father son saw that one yesterday on social media. Father son, boom boom, two copies yeah. getting on the program. <laughs> so that's awesome and appreciate it. Oh, oh, there's some. In, there's some funny reviews. I got. I got. I will have to read some of the reviews. Some of the Amazon reviews. Some of them are awesome. <laughs> some of them are awesome. There's one. I'll, I. I should pull it out. But um, there's some awesome reviews. So if you want to write a review, you can do that too. It's a work of art, really. I mean, f- to look at it. I think it looks pretty cool. It's pretty. Cool. <laughs> there's no other books that really look like that. Not that, that I know seen. of. No. <laughs> so that's that. And like I said, the. The audio version is on MP3, Google Play, iTunes, Amazon Music, and all that. If you need leadership support for your team or your business, then you can hire Echelon Front, which is our leadership and management consulting company. It's me, Leif Babin, JP Deneau, Dave Burke. Email info at echelonfront.com. And if you kind of liked hanging out with us on this podcast and you want to maybe cruise with us some more, you can find us on the interwebs. Twitter, Instagram, and a fishy boy. (laughs) Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And again, thanks to all of you out there in uniform on the front lines like Jacob Walter in the dirt and the filth and the discomfort and the danger out there holding the line. Thank you all for what you do to the police and law enforcement and firefighters and medical emergency technicians and the rest of the first responders. Thank you for keeping us safe here at home to the teachers out there that are teaching our kids teaching those young troublemakers like I was yeah. putting them on the right path teaching them that discipline equals freedom thank you for doing what you do and the rest of you that are out there doing your job and doing it to the best of your ability making life better for yourself your family your community our country and the world Thanks for grinding and grappling and striving and scratching and continuing day after day after day to get out there and get after it. 
So until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.